get going this evening. Oh, how sweet. Oh, that's awesome. I've got two prayer letters tonight we're going to start around um, for you to um, sign. Um, one of these is for John and Jerry O'Neill. John's back in the hospital, but it's really more of just an encouragement letter to them. Um, so one of them is for them. The other is for the Billy Frankie family. This is one of our neighbors to the church here um, who passed away. So it's a grief letter. Just letting them know that we as a church are praying for them. Um, and I already shared with you that her services are going to be here at the church next um, Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Uh, memorial service for, for Billy Frankie. So those are the two letters that you'll see tonight as we get those started here. Mrs. Battle passed away. Um, and I don't know, I think the funeral is going to be held in Cuero, Texas. It was, and I know that she was just transported from uh, service in Austin down to Victoria. Yeah. And then the, the service will be at the Victoria, that's where their family is. Right. Elmo, Elmo and Shirley are from Cuero originally, right. so, so that's where it will be. Okay, if you've got your Bible tonight, uh, be finding Matthew, the seventh chapter. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, we're, we're down to verses 21 through 23 tonight. We're just about to finish up um, the Sermon on the Mount. I think that next Wednesday we should finish this up. So uh, we've been in it for quite a few weeks now, um, covering chapters 5, 6, and 7 in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, working through um, the Sermon on the Mount. We've been calling this uh, series, this Bible study, Impacting Your World for Christ, which as I've kind of said every week, is maybe a little bit different approach to a Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, certainly Jesus is laying out for us uh, throughout this. You can see it, that he's laying out some ways for us as believers, um, not only to experience him in a personal way, but also how our lives might impact the lives of others. And even at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you get that picture loud and strong when he calls us to be light in darkness and to be salt in the world, you can you can definitely tell he's he's wanting us to have an impact and to influence um, our world for Christ. Um, I've kind of gone back and forth every week at things that I've given you, but if you'll look at your Bible study sheet tonight, you'll notice that we are up to 17 important keys to impacting your world for Christ. If we don't get anything else out of this Bible study, um, you're going to come away from here with 18 um, keys from the Sermon on the Mount at how you may have an impact on your world for Christ. And I think um, with each one of these, you can kind of see them rooted in the Scripture, uh, in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7 uh, in this study. I think it's some really good practical stuff for us. Um, you could probably, as we have, uh, just begin to concentrate on those even one at a time and saying, you know, I want to begin to develop uh, just my ability to, to know Christ personally or to begin to reflect Him more and, and begin to develop those in your life so that, that God can use it to impact the lives of, of those around you. So I've, I've given you all 17 of those tonight. Um, uh, that's, that's, where, that's where we've been over the past few weeks, and I'm not going to take the time to read through um, all of those, but here is the one we're going to be on this evening. Um, it's number 17 there, and there's a typo there. Uh, it has nothing to do with Tom, whoever Tom is. <laughs> It could be Tom Davis, uh, it could be Tom Royal, we got lots of Tom Searcy, we got lots of Toms here, so that's a typo, it should say to, so kind of scratch that M out, to impact your world for Christ, you must, and this is so important, and we're going to see it tonight as Jesus is closing out this sermon, you must make sure of your profession and calling as a believer, make sure of your profession and calling as a believer. Um, and we'll dig into that tonight as we kind of work through it. And we see the word profession there. We're not talking about your job, you know, what your job is. We're talking about your profession of faith. Make sure your profession of faith and your calling as a believer. Um, and, and we'll see that tonight as, as Jesus is going to challenge us with, um, I think, is what some of his most powerful words that he ever spoke. And one pastor, you're going to see this tonight. I'll read the quote to you in a minute calls this the scariest verses in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Um, and you'll, you'll see that this evening um, as we're looking into it. Now, um, if you'll remember, 
this study started with this statement where we said, before you can impact your, the, the life of another for Christ, you must have been impacted by him. And so like bookends in this sermon, Jesus begins there, remember that, with his beatitude, showing us how to come into relationship with him. And that's where that very first principle came from, that if we're going to impact our world for Christ, we have to first have been impacted by him. Now what's interesting is that tonight he's going to, be, he's going to say to us, before you can impact your world for Christ, you have to have been impacted for him, have you? That's essentially how he's closing out the sermon. He's putting it back in our court, and he's saying, do you know him? Are you sure that you know him? Are you sure of your profession of faith in him? Are you sure that he is yours? Or are you just saying, Lord, Lord, but not letting him be Lord? And that's what you're going to hear tonight um, in this uh, passage that we're going to look at. So um, with, without kind of digging into it uh, much further, I want you to look at your Bible there. These should be familiar words to you. Um, we're in Matthew chapter 7. Um, just just kind of feast your eyes on it for a second before we read the passage. I want you just to look at your Bible there. I don't know if your Bible has headings, um, but, but if you look at it, remember we've been saying the last few weeks that we are now in the invitation to the sermon, okay, or the response time. Uh, he's, he's gone through that, the entire gamut just like we would when we preach a sermon. By the way, I know I've moved you back tonight, so if that's hard to see, that's not. So if you need to turn around and take a look at that one, it's really big, and you can really see what it says back there if you need to look at it. Scott, it's going to be hard for you, brother, unless you come up here and look, but that one's, that one's really clear back there. Do y'all like my ducks? So here's the title of tonight's study. Are you the real McCoy or are you a real decoy? Um, and we're going to talk about the marks of uh, genuine faith, the marks of true faith uh, tonight that Jesus gives us. So look at your Bible there, Matthew chapter 7. Just, um, and if you're at home watching with us tonight, just open your Bible there and look at it. I want, I want you to see where this invitation kind of begins because he lays it out pretty clearly. Um, if you look at it there, we're going to be in verses 21 through 23 tonight, but if you back up to verse 13, in verses 13 and 14, he's beginning the invitation there. And he's saying there's two ways to choose. You can go the narrow way or the broad way. Choose. Okay, And then if you'll kind of look at it there, in verses 15 through 20, he's going to say, beware of false teachers that will pull you off track, and what kind of fruit do you have? Good fruit, bad fruit, that tells how real your profession is, right? And now he's going to lay it in the line for us in verses 21 through 23, and he's going to flat out state it. Um, and again, one preacher calls this the scariest passage uh, in the Bible, so Here's why he says that. Look at verses 21 through 23. This is what we're going to focus on tonight um, in our time together. As we're kind of finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, here's what he says. Jesus' words here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And uh, that's a pretty eye-opening, um, powerful passage of Scripture. And, and Jerry, maybe it's appropriate that I say, Tom impact there because this was one of Tom's favorite verses. He quoted this all the time. Y'all remember that? We'd be sitting in here on Wednesday nights in Bible studies and Tom Davis would quote Matthew 7, 21 and following there um, to us. Now, just think about what I said a minute ago. Um, one preacher, again, has called this the scariest passage in the Bible. Why do you think he might ascribe those words to this passage? What, what, do you, what would make this passage so scary, do you think? Yes, Cindy? Okay. Okay. So your idea is that it may be scary because some people think they have a relationship with the Lord and they really don't, and they're basing that just on the things that they do, like go to church or some of those. Yes, and I think we're going to see that played out as we kind of dig into this study tonight in Jesus' words. Anybody else? What, what would this to you be, maybe cause someone to say, this is a pretty scary passage? 
Yeah, Sarah? Okay, so what I hear Sarah saying, I don't, and Sarah, you can clarify this if I'm wrong about this. What I hear saying is that verses like this make you question your own salvation, maybe make you doubt your salvation a little bit. Like to go back and say, did I do everything right? Is it just a shallow profession of my lips or is it real? And it kind of makes you go back and want to re- is, is that kind of what you're saying? Is, okay, and certainly we can see that, right? Um, if you Google this verse, and it'll probably be to gotquestions.com, which I love that website, and in there it says that this question raises, this passage raises two big questions for Christians. One, is, is your salvation secure? Because it raises the question that not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is actually saved. So is, it, is your salvation secure? And so I think that's one of the things that you're kind of getting at there. That's one of them. The other is, uh, just because someone performs miracles and is a miracle worker, does that mean that they're of God? Because it raises the question of that too. We'll, dis- we'll dig into that one more as we get into it tonight. So those are the two biggies that come from here. So you can see, right? I mean, if there's a verse in Scripture that might make you question your own salvation, that could be scary. Of course, I don't think it's always necessarily bad to question your salvation. And I'll show you that as we get into this tonight. Scripture very clearly tells us we are to examine ourselves to see if we are in the Lord. And you'll see that repeated in Scripture where we're told to check ourselves out, to be very sure of our calling and our election. Um, so, so we see that admonition in Scripture. Um, but passages like this really bring us to the point of questioning our faith or maybe were we genuine in it? Are we basing our faith on the right things or the wrong things? Anybody else see something here that might be scary if you just read this passage? Yes, John? Yeah, yeah, just that, that thing, he who does the will, am I following God's will? Am I in God's will? So, do, you know, if, if that's the determining thing, I'm not always there. And we know we always don't, do, don't always do it God's way. So what does that say about us? So, okay, that's, yeah. Anybody else see something scary there? Yes. I do, I do have a section in here if, if I actually get to that and I'm actually able to say that. But yeah, I mean, you tr- you'll notice tonight that I've tried to kind of condense tonight's study a little bit where we can get through and kind of answer some of those things because I think this is such a... No, 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 thank you for sharing that. Because I think this is such an important verse uh, for us. And you hear it preached and taught a lot. Um, and I'll also say this. I think verses like this are really... Um, important for our day. Um, Like, you know, we talked about false prophets last week. That's important for our day. The broad and the narrow way. That discussion's important for our day, right? And this passage is really important for our day because we're confused in the church today. Why does it seem that so many in the church are not going 
according to Scripture, like they're drifting or, or they're not following God's word? Or, well, could it be that some of them are saying, Lord, Lord, but don't know him as Lord? It raises some questions like that, doesn't it? Um, so uh, this, this becomes a very powerful passage. I want to share with you a couple of quotes from some um, that caught my attention as I was working on this study and, and just kind of doing some uh, looking at commentaries and what different ones have said about this passage uh, because I think the passage is so Im- important. Um, one pastor, this is, is, is Rick Boyne, and here's what he says about this passage, and I thought it was a very interesting statement. And I want to kind of get your feedback on this statement. Um, but here's what he says. This is Rick Boyne, and he pastors uh, a, a large church. Um, and this is what he said in, in his commentary on this passage. He said, every time I come across Matthew seven twenty one, I am taken back by how scary this verse must be to religious people. That's interesting. By that, I mean people who are desperately trying to get to heaven by doing good or by being good. There are many people who call themselves Christian, followers of Jesus, or believer, who quite frankly are only fooling themselves because they are trying to add something to the gospel. What are they adding? Their own effort? That's how he says it. Isn't that an interesting statement about this passage? And of course, you can see where he's getting that uh, from this passage. Now, um, once again, we've already talked about why some people would call this scary. And we've even talked about why it would be scary to religious people, right? Um, Because if you're a churchgoer and you go all the time, verses like this can make you doubt your salvation or make you question whether um, whether you're following him uh, and doing the things that you do out of a love for him and because you know him or you're just doing it kind of as a routine thing to make you feel good about yourself. But, but think about this. Um, why do you think, or, or what do you think he means by religious people desperately trying to get to heaven by doing good? Do we see evidence of that today? Uh, what, what do you think he means by that statement? He, when he talks about religious people desperately trying to get to heaven by being good. And, and even in churches like ours, do we see evidence of that, you think? What do you think he means? Desperately. Desperately um, trying to get to heaven by doing good. Yes. Okay. They're missing the faith. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good, Mary. Thank you. What else? Anybody else think? What, what do you think he means by that? Desperately um, trying to get to heaven by doing good. Yes. unto him to worship him okay good okay yes sir Right. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah's hitting, hitting on that. And I, I think when we hear um, desperately trying to get to heaven by doing good, and we always think of the good things that we do, but we don't think of all the bad things we don't do, that become our, our signature of whether or not we're going to heaven. I'm going to heaven because I don't do this. Th- think of all the list of don'ts that we think we have to live by. Um, in order that we get to go to heaven. Well, the things that you do don't get you there, and the things that you don't do don't get you there, right? But, but you see what Sarah's saying is that 
we think we're good because we don't do certain things. And we pass this kind of legalistic code of, well, you can only be a Christian if you don't do this. Now, we're going to talk about sin in a minute, okay? We all sin, and we all know there are things that are wrong for a believer. But what keeps a person out of heaven? A rejection of Jesus Christ, right? Not placing your faith and trust in Him. Um, but we often make it a test of what we do or don't do. Uh, that, that's just a very interesting statement if you think about it. So, so that's uh, Rick Boys, and, and to me that's a very interesting interesting kind of statement today. And we see a lot of us get caught up in this almost treadmill type religion where we think we have to go, 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 do, 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 all of these things to stay in God's favor. And that doesn't, that doesn't make him like us or not like us anymore. Yes, Cindy? Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, as an act of worship. Good, good. Okay. So pretty powerful statement, isn't it? When you think about that kind of commentary on it. And then um, John MacArthur, you all know that I quote him a lot. And, and he has a whole commentary section on this passage and digs into it a lot. And I've... I've shared this statement with you, but I pulled out his commentary when I was working on this Bible study on Matthew chapter 7, and this is the context of this statement. I have read this statement before from the pulpit on Sundays and sermons. I've used this as an illustration. I think I've even used it on Wednesday nights, and I was amazed when I was reading his commentary on Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when he makes this statement, and you've heard it before, but think about what he's saying here, and we'll kind of talk about this one. He says this, uh, and he's talking about this passage. He says, various polls in recent years have estimated that perhaps 50% of Americans identify themselves as born-again Christians. But on the basis of the Bible's description of true believers and the fact that few really come on God's terms, those estimates could not be remotely connect correct. By scriptural standards, it's hard to believe that even half of the church members of the United States are true believers. And I've shared that statement with you before, but this is the context of that statement when he's talking about this. And, and if you listen to the statement again, I'll put it in the context of even what he's saying of how these verses relate to things around them. Uh, for example, when he says, but on the basis of the Bible's description of, of true believers and the fact that few really come on God's terms, he's making a reference to Matthew 7.14 where he talks about, and if, if you look at your Bible there, um, it's, it's where he talks about few find it. Remember that? So broad is the road and wide is the way and many go that way, but narrow is the road, narrow is the gate, and few go that way. That's him pulling that into this passage. So he's saying that, you know, Bible's description that only a few find it, and yet we're saying today there's 50% of Americans. Do you see evidence of that? I don't think we see evidence of that. Um, and so e even, our, even our own kind of spiritual vision of our country today tells us that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, right, is letting him be Lord, really knows him as Lord. Um, and, and we kind of see that played out um, even, in, even in our day. So those are some, some pretty powerful things. Now, um, how do you distinguish true faith from false faith? If you back up a little bit in our passage of Scripture, you see a little bit he talked about being fruit inspectors. You know, by their fruit you'll know them, he said. So you began to see some of that, but I want you just to think about that a little bit. How, how can we distinguish true faith from false faith? True believers from false believers. The real McCoy as, a, as opposed to a real decoy. How, how, do you, how do you distinguish that really? I know it's not ours to judge someone. But how do you distinguish those who are saying, Lord, Lord, and those who are really letting him be Lord? What, what, what would you say to that? We're gonna, that's what we're going to look at tonight from this passage, because he's giving us that. Okay? But what, what would you say? Yes.
Yeah, that's right, Marcy. I mean, for us to judge someone whether they're whether they're there or not, we, we don't know, right? We we can't really know what's going on inside of another person. All we can really look at is what's coming from their life, the the fruit that we see, and you know. And if we see fruit that kind of concerns us, we ought to be praying for that person, you know. Anybody else a thought there? How, how do you distinguish that? Yes, Diane. So if, the, if a person's a genuine believer, there's there's a difference in them, is what you're saying. You, you see something different. And as another believer, you discern that difference in them, right? I've always thought, you know, the Christ in me will connect with the Christ in another person that's a believer. And if you have a check in your spirit, it's not so that you judge them, but it's that you need to be, listen to that. You need to be careful there and just be aware of that. Um, if, if you think about our study so far, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Christ taught about the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven and its citizens. All through this, he's giving us that. Um, he, he taught all through the Sermon on the Mount about what those characteristics really looked like. And these are some of them, not all of them. And so if you'll notice, I've titled this, Some Characteristics of Kingdom Citizens as Seen in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, and this is just a kind of a quick run through there of some of these characteristics. For example... He told us they are poor in spirit. Remember that? That kingdom citizens, he told us early on in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, that they're, they are poor in spirit. When the world doesn't recognize their need for God, true believers do recognize their need for God. And they cry out to him for salvation and sanctification. So, so think about that. They're poor in spirit. In other words, there's, a, there's this characteristic out there of a person who's a genuine believer, and that is that they're constantly crying out to God as their hope. They're constantly crying out to Him. They're poor in spirit. God, I can't handle this. I can't do this on my own. I'm dependent on you. Whereas a person that, that maybe is, is full of, of themselves and their ability to kind of just navigate through things on their own and be strong, you know, buck up. Um, when, when you see that kind of pride in a person's life, that may be a little bit telling. Um, so, so they are poor in spirit. Sec, another thing that, that he tells us early uh, in the Beatitudes is that they are mourners. And if you remember, they are mourners. In the, in the, remember in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 4, um, we talked about how blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we said that's not necessarily talking about death or loss there, it's talking about mourning or grieving over sin, okay? So if you think about that, when the world enjoys or even promotes or condones sin, kingdom citizens are broken over sin. To me, even in the church today, there is a very obvious difference between a genuine brokenness over the sin of our world that we're in right now. You will see believers in churches who are grieved over what's happening in our world. And then you will see believers in churches who are celebrating openness. They're, they're celebrating acceptance and tolerance of things that Scripture teaches are wrong. Hey, that's a telltale sign that we ought to be looking at. What should we be over sin in our world today? Broken, right? Right? And, and you can see this everywhere. Um, the third one there, um, and we see this in the Sermon on the Mount, um, kingdom citizens, they are more than just outwardly righteous, okay? There's a difference between wearing your spirituality, wearing your righteousness on the outside. In other words, I'm righteous because of what I do. I go to church every week, I read my Bible, I sing in the choir, I tithe, that's my righteousness. But has it translated into inwardly into who you are? Has it changed how you live, how you relate to other people? So true kingdom citizens have more than just an outward righteousness. There's an internal change that's taken place. So, you, you know, they may be in conflict sometimes within, even within themselves, but generally you can see it in, in how they treat other people, uh, in, in attitudes, in, in, in the spirit of that person. There, there's more than just an outward righteousness. The fourth one there, um, and, and I believe this is true, 
they pursue their inner righteousness through spiritual disciplines. They, in, they pursue their inner righteousness through spiritual disciplines. And here's, here's what I mean by that. And I want you to think about this. I think that a person who is a genuine Christian will hunger for the Word of God. They'll hunger for prayer. They will hunger for the church. Do you see what I'm saying? They will, they will be drawn to those things. If you hear a person claiming to be a Christian who doesn't like to spend time in God's Word, doesn't like to pray, doesn't really see church as significant for them, doesn't see the importance of the fellowship of other believers, there's no openness to that. You see what I'm saying? If there's no attraction to the things of Christ, those spiritual disciplines, that's a sign that something's missing. Um, so, so I think that's one of them, uh, just characteristics there that we see have seen through this. And Jesus talks about that. Remember how much time he gives talking about giving, fasting, praying? In, in this, he talks about that, uh, the, the importance of the Word of God. Uh, he talks about that in here. Uh, and then the fifth one here, um, a person that's a kingdom citizen is they will get rid of sin in their own lives so it's not that we're sinless because we're not as believers, but what is it? We are constantly attuned to him and he's convicting us and he's constantly, there's a we're work in progress. He's constantly showing us, we're confessing, we're repenting, and we live in this relationship with him that, listen, we may mess up from time to time, just like, you know, your little two or three year old might mess up from time to time, but you, we get corrected and we correct it and we move forward, right? So we all sin and fall short. We're, we're not saying we're not sinners, but we're constantly in this relationship with Christ where he's convicting us, we're repenting, we're confessing it, and, and it's, you know, two steps forward, a step back, two steps forward. So, so they are getting rid of sin in their own lives and they help others do the same in order to honor God. And how do we help others do the same? By introducing them to him, right? So, so, those, so, so those are just some characteristics there that you see. In, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, I keep referring back to that because that's where he's beginning and leading into this invitation that we're now kind of seeing wholly completed in verses 21 through 23. Christ began his conclusion on the Sermon on the Mount, and he called people to choose between two pathways, the narrow road of the kingdom of heaven, which leads to life, or the broad road which, of the world, which leads to destruction. By mentioning the narrow road, he described how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not, that the, it's not the path of least resistance, right? It is the hard road. And, and it doesn't mean that you got to work hard to be saved. Jesus has already done on the work. But, but listen, uh, it, it costs us something to become a Christian. We are to give our very selves up. What does it mean to call him Lord? It means we've surrendered all of ourselves to him, to let him be in control. And so that's not an easy thing to do. Don't you struggle with that every single day, to relinquishing more and more of self to him? And how many times throughout the day do you feel him convicting you that, hey, buddy, you've taken the reins back in this area. This, this isn't him. This is you. So, so if you think about it, that's, that's, it's hard. Um, so so, so that's, that's a key there, and, and I think an important one. Um, to compound that difficulty of getting into the kingdom, Christ shares that there are false prophets and deceivers around us that would trip us up and pull us off target off this narrow road. And finally here, he's going to conclude by a Sermon on the Mount, this kind of other common reason, and that is that that keeps people from the kingdom of heaven, and that's self-deception. So look at this, three things that keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. He gives them to us in this invitation, and he's, he's drawing us to himself to be kingdom citizens, okay? So one is the way is hard, right? It's one of the things that keeps people out of the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's, it's hard. P people who think, you, you know, why do people hold on to a pew instead of coming to Christ? What, what makes us do that? Because it's hard to relinquish control of ourselves to him, right? It's, it's hard to die to self. It's, it's hard to do that. So, so the way is hard. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 tells us the way is hard. Second, we said it, there's false teachers and false prophets out there that are deceiving us, right? And he talks about that in verses 15 through 20. So there's false prophets that keep many people from the kingdom of heaven. 
listen, there's a lot of preaching out there today that just says, I'm okay, you're okay, just, just be yourself, just, you, you know, one path is just as good as another path. Uh, we, don't, we haven't cornered the market on heaven, that there's many paths to God, not, not just the Christian path. And that's a popular message out there in lots of circles. That's false teaching, and it will keep people out of heaven. I'm just telling you, because there's only one way, right? And then the third one there is self-deception, and Jesus talks about that in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, self-deception. And, and that's a big, big one. Um, and that's where we're going to kind of plant it tonight. Now, some people have a hard time with that because, like Sarah mentioned a while ago, passages like this can cause people to doubt their salvation. Remember, Peter said this in 2 Peter 1.10. He said, you are to make your calling and election sure. You, you know what he's telling us to do, right? Check yourselves out. Constantly be examining yourself. Check yourself out. Are you, are you, passages like this ought to cause us to go, Lord, have I really let you be Lord of my life? It, it ought to cause us to, to evaluate our own relationship with him. And then Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we are to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith unless, of course, you fail the test. He even goes that far. So, you know, what, the, what does that say to us? That it's possible that we've deceived ourselves. So examine yourself to see that you're in the Lord. So, so those things become very very real for us. So here's what I want to do, because I think Jesus is giving us some of these things in verses 21 through 23. Um, and then he's going to close out like every good sermon. He's going to, we're going to look at this next week, beginning in verse 24 down to verse 27. He closes with a gripping illustration. And, and I love that. He leaves them kind of with this illustration that kind of closes out the sermon. And that's where we'll be next week. Um, but here's what he's doing in verses 21 through 24, uh, 23. And we could have gone a couple of ways with this. Um, but I believe that he is giving us this contrast between those who say, Lord, Lord, and those who are letting him be Lord. In other words, he gives us here these distinguishing, authentic marks of a true believer. Those emerge from these verses. Um, or as we're calling it, he gives us some distinguishing marks between um, the real McCoy and the real decoys. Okay, And, and so we'll see them. And, and what I want to do just in the time that we have left is kind of work through these. And you might go, well, it's just, what, three verses there, verses 21, 22, 23. But there's six marks here of true faith that distinguish authentic believers from false ones. Um, and and he's, he's giving these to us. And, and, and Marcy, like you mentioned a while ago, he's not giving them to us to give us a license to judge another person. That's between them and the Lord. He's giving this to us so that we check ourselves out, that we examine ourselves. Are we in the faith? Or do we need to get on the narrow road? Do we need to begin to follow him? So, so here's the six marks, and I'm just going to begin to work through them and give them to you. Um, and we'll just kind of work through them one at a time. So here's the first one. Write this down, and I'll explain to you what we mean because these are some big words. And, sir, you might have to leave some of this up there uh, for us. But uh, here's number one. True faith, and this is the first mark, is more than an orthodox profession of Christ. Just write that down, and we'll talk about what that means. True faith is more than an orthodox profession of Christ. You say, well, where are you getting that? Well, look at verse 21 and just notice what he says there. This is an orthodox profession of Christ. Jesus begins by saying in verse 21, not everyone who says to me this orthodox profession, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That's an orthodox profession, okay? Not everyone who says the right words, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, okay? Um, Christ describes how there will be some who stand before him on the day of judgment and call him Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that profession. Carol, you mentioned this a while ago. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay. And we, we say that verse all the time. I say it a lot of time at invitation time on Sundays. Um, that's a powerful verse. Jesus here is not saying we should not call him Lord. We know that would be inconsistent with Scripture. He is identified as Lord of Lords and King of Kings in Scripture. And when we come to him, we don't just come, him, come to him for fire insurance that is a Savior, 
right? But we come to him giving him control of our lives, making him Lord. But there's a difference between an orthodox profession of saying, Lord, Lord, and actually letting him be Lord. There's, those are two different things. And, and many people can go through the motions of saying, Lord, Lord. Um, John Stott said this about profession. John R.W. Stott. By the way, if you ever get a chance to read anything from him, he wrote a great book on the cross, uh, John R.W. Stott, um, great theologian. But here's what he says about the profession. He says, what better Christian profession could be given? Here are people who call Jesus Lord with courtesy, orthodoxy, and enthusiasm in private devotion and in public ministry. What can be wrong with this? In itself, nothing. And yet everything is wrong because it is talk without truth, profession without reality. It will not save them on the day of judgment. Now, what is he saying? What's he saying? Sarah, you're laughing. Do you see it? What's he saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. De real McCoy and real decoy. He knows the difference, right? So, so, so think about what he's saying. Here's, here's, what, here's the mistake we make sometimes in Baptist churches, okay? We give them this orthodox profession they have to make, okay? You have to say this. We call it the sinner's prayer. You ever heard that? Sinner's prayer. You've got to say these words. Show me that in Scripture. Show me a sinner's prayer in Scripture. It, it's not. And, and those are just words, right? Uh, just reciting words is not going to save anyone. Just a profession of the lips. All through the church, there's been orthodox professions of what it means to be saved. You can read Scripture till you're blue in the face. Right? Lots of people that aren't saved know a lot about Scripture. But what's the difference? And, and, and what's he saying here? That, that it is talk without truth, profession without reality. It will not save them on the day of judgment. It's not just a profession. It has to be, it's life changing. It has to change who we are on the inside. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a statement we throw out there. It's a very cliche saying. We've heard it, but it's the truth, isn't it? That there is a difference between a person who says, I'm a Christian, and a person truly is a believer, and it's evidenced by the fruit of their life, by how they live. So, so you know, to me, I, I'm a guy who believes that in, in doctrine of Scripture, I, I think Orthodox Christianity is important that we understand what Scripture teaches about things. And, and, and I think we ought to pour into the teaching of God's Word and those kind of things. But listen, just the teaching of God's Word, just understanding the doctrines of the faith won't save you. That, that's what he's saying here. It's, it's more than just a surface kind of... Now, remember in the Sermon on the Mount, who is he primarily addressing here with this? He's, he's, speaking, to, he's speaking to those believers gathered around, but, but who's it directed towards? Most everything he said. That's right. The religion, the religionist of his day, okay? The most religious people around them, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the religious elite of the day. And he has he's already said to them, listen, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not inherit heaven. And remember, we talked about that. They had to have heard that and gone, oh no, I don't stand a chance. But now we understand what he's saying. It can't just be a surface profession. It has to have changed who you are. And the evidence of whether or not it had changed them is abundant. Re read the New Testament. I mean, the, these very guys, it hadn't even changed them to see who Jesus was. They crucified him. So that's, that's a pretty powerful picture that you see there. Okay? So um, the problem with this orthodox profession is that it is by itself. Uh, simple belief without an act of the will does not save. Um, James said that even demons believe in God and tremble. Okay? So, so we kind of hear that, hear that from him. Um, demons themselves have orthodox faith. They know who Jesus is. 
right? They know him. They tremble in his presence, but they, they don't know him internally as Lord and Savior. You, you see what I'm saying? So you, you have to kind of understand kind of what he's getting at there. Sadly, many are raised in the church and have an orthodox profession, but they've never really met Christ in a personal way. Kent Hughes said this, he said, all true Christians say, Lord, Lord, but all who say, Lord, Lord, let me read this again, all true Christians say, Lord, Lord, but not all who say, Lord, Lord, are true Christians. That's how he says it. And he calls it intellectual orthodoxy, does not indicate saving faith. You can be absolutely correct in your belief about Christ's nature and person, his substitutionary atonement, his resurrection, and his return. You can have even fought against heretics and yet not be truly saved. And I don't think that's the message that's getting out today from many of our churches. That when Jesus said, I'm the way, he's talking about a personal relationship with him. Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? That's that's it. And, we, and, and think about this. We just don't hear that preached very much anymore. That, that he is the way. That, that you have, it's, it's Jesus Christ. Do we know him personally? So, so that's the first one. And I think that's a big one. And he's talking about it there when he says, not everyone who says to me, not everyone who makes the profession, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the first kind of disturbing thing that we hear. But, but, the, but, but the mark of a true believer is that their faith is more than just a profession of the lips. That's what he's saying. Here's the second one. You ready? And this one kind of gets played out in two and three in different ways. Um, true faith is more than seemingly successful ministry. True faith is more than a seemingly successful ministry. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Look, look what Jesus says, because he's going to paint for you a successful ministry here. All right? Verse 22. Many will say to me on that day. Okay, he's still talking about this profession. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? That's a successful ministry, okay? If you are prophesying in his name, if you're casting out evil spirits and seeing that happen, and you're doing wonders in his name, that's a successful ministry. Um, now think about this, because we, we talked about this a minute ago, because it's kind of interesting that he, he throws this in there. Um, were the miracles and the wonders of the false believers genuine or false? Now just think about it. Were the, were the miracles, the wonders of these false believers, were they genuine or were they false? Yes. That's right. This is kind of a tough thing to wade through. Now, now just think about that. These false believers also profess many mighty works done in the name of Christ. They prophesied, they cast out demons, Jesus said. They did many powerful deeds. Some Bibles translate that not as wonders, but miracles. Certainly these professors could have been lying, or the works that they did could have been done through demonic power, um, just like Pharaoh's sorcerers mimicked Moses in the book of Exodus. Remember that. However, what's interesting is Christ doesn't rebuke them. Notice this. He doesn't declare that their works were dubious or demonically inspired. He doesn't say that. He said they were done in his name. That's interesting. It kind of lends, lends itself to the fact that they were probably genuine, that the faith of these professors was not um, genuine, but their faith wasn't genuine, but, but their acts, their works may have been. How can that be? Well, think of Judas. Think about Judas. Judas. Jesus sent out the disciples and they cast out demons and they did many works and many wonders in his name. Was, Jesus, was Judas a part of that group? He was. That's pretty interesting. You mean God could use a Judas to touch someone's life even though he was a betrayer and did not know him? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Just, I mean, think about that. Um, you, you can kind of read all kinds of things like that. Um, think about this one. Um, God anointed Balaam, a prophet of Baal, to bless Israel and give a prophecy about the coming Messiah in, in Numbers 23. 
Caiaphas, the high priest who helped put Christ to death, also prophesied about Christ's coming. So I remember this even as a boy, and I've heard many preachers say it, and I've said it myself, and I can remember my preacher saying it when I was little, but here's, here's the little saying. Sarah, this is on a slide. God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. Now think about that. What does that mean? God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. Yeah. God can use anybody he wants to use, right? He, he can harden the heart of Pharaoh and use Pharaoh to preach his message. He, he can use a Judas who will betray Christ and send him to a cross, but he can use him at one point. He, he can. So that's one of the things that kind of makes, and, and Marcy, what you said while well, ago about judging another person can make it very hard. Some of these people that aren't even believers may have some fruit that looks good at times. All right? So, so that's kind of, kind of interesting when, when you think about um, the direction of that. Um, service, and, and what we're saying is that service, even good service, is not proof of salvation. That's what we're getting at here. Do you see that? That, that just because somebody can do all these good things, somebody has good works or, or they're serving really hard and they're accomplishing a lot of good things, we go, well, that person must be a believer I mean, it's important for us to understand that service isn't proof of salvation. And and we need to be preaching the truth of the gospel and praying for the Holy Spirit to convict lost hearts. Because what could be more... You know the hardest person to get saved in the world? Who is it, Wesley? Church members. That's right. If John MacArthur's statement is true, 50% of church members are lost... Those are the hardest ones to get saved. Why? They're already doing all these good things. They're already serving. God's using them. They've even seen some fruit from it. I must be a Christian. So-and-so has been saved through me. Yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting truth. Okay, here's the third one. You ready? I don't know. we got some more to go here. Um, number three, um, true faith. And this kind of goes along with the one we just said about successful ministry. True faith is more than attending church, listening to sermons, and reading scripture. Did you get them? Good, good deal. Um, now, I'm not contradicting what I said earlier, because earlier we said that a true believer will want those spiritual disciplines in their life. They'll crave scripture reading. They'll crave church because it feeds them, right? They'll, they'll crave these very things. They'll, they'll, they'll crave wanting to hear God's word preached. That, that there will be a craving for that. But what we're saying here is that true faith is more than just those things. Not that those things aren't important, but those things are not the test of how authentic your faith is. There's lots of folks that like to listen to good preachers, and there's lots of people that aren't saved that spend a lot of time reading scripture, going to church because it makes them feel better uh, about themselves. Um, once again, verse 22, he kind of gives us this kind of same thought. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? Did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons? And, and now, now let's translate that over in today. What would that look like? It would be like, Lord, Lord, did we not go to church every time the doors were open? Did we, did we not go and listen to your men preach God's word? Did we not check that little thing on the envelope every, every week that said, I did my daily Bible readings and I read scripture every single Did I not do all of those things? And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, that's a pretty powerful truth. There. True faith is more than just doing those things. And, and once again, it kind of lends to what we're saying and what he's teaching. It's more than just a shallow profession of the lips. It has to be a life change uh, in, in what we are and who we are. J.D., you mentioned this a while ago, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, um, who, who many believe, and I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but some people believe that James, the half-brother of Jesus, is giving commentary on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but the book of James, some consider to be a commentary on this study we've been doing, James, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Read it sometime that way. But some, some believe that, that James is actually a commentary. But anyway, James says this. He says in James 1.22 that we are um, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then he adds this, deceiving ourselves. 
Okay? So, so, you know, God is to penetrate who we are. It's supposed to change who we are, how we do things, how we act out and live out our faith from the inside out. Um, and, and here he says to be doers of the word rather than hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So it's, he's even raised the possibility there that we can deceive ourselves by that. Uh, being a hearer of God's word, um, just, just hearing it, um, attending church and hearing sermons preached, just being a hearing of that is not necessarily proof of salvation. Um, what do you think would make the Bible attractive even to those who aren't truly saved? Why study it um, if they're not going to obey it? What, what would make the Bible truly attractive even to those who don't, who don't know him in a personal way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. why, why would people be attracted to it, um, even to those who aren't truly saved? Um, there, there's a lot of um, ethical advice in Scripture. There, there's a lot of wisdom, what they call wisdom literature. Uh, read the Psalms sometimes. People find a lot of comfort in the Psalms who may not even be genuine believers. Uh, read the Proverbs sometimes. There's, there's helpful Proverbs about life and how to live life and how to be successful. People all the time are gleaning great truths from this. Not every book that I read is a Christian book. I read some secular books too. And it's amazing to me how, time, how many times in secular books they'll quote things Jesus said or, or something in Scripture and that person doesn't even claim to be a Christian. Um, so so that's, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, think about that one. Okay, here's number four. You ready? i got to move on. Uh, i got two, a couple more here to go before we finish, but we may have to skip some stuff. But number four. True faith includes a lifestyle of obedience to the Word of God. And this is really important with number three because it's more than just hearing the Word, right, or reading the Word or studying the Word. Um, there's an obedience to the Word. Verse 21 again says, This is not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who, who does enter the kingdom of heaven? Verse 21. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Um, how do we know what the will of the Father is who is in heaven? How do we know? The Word, right? I mean, this is what He's, this is the book, this is what he's given us um, for us to know Him and, and how to live in relationship with Him, how, how to walk with Him, how, how to serve Him. It's, it's all found um, in His Word, and there's an obedience to it. So to me, it's not enough for us just to read the Word, and, and I say this all the time. J.D. and I were talking about this today. I think, you know, it's important to study the deep things of Scripture. It's in, important for us to study the background. I love the historical background of Scripture. I love giving you the facts behind a passage. But if you can't walk out of here with a truth that changes your life, it's done you no good. That with Scripture, there comes an application, applying it. It's relevant for us. It ought to change how we live. And for a, general, for a, gen, a genuine faith, there is a lifestyle of obedience that is I want, to, I want to practice what God's Word says. I want to live it out. Some people look at this as a great ancient book of wisdom and literature that can help me for my life every single day. I'm going to tell you it's way more than that. It's way more than that. This book tells us how to live in relationship with God. 
And how, how every day I can live like that. How I can walk as he would call me to walk. How, how to be in relationship with him. How to touch the hearts and lives of others with him. How to be more directed towards him and, and the things of him in obedience. So, so that's an important one. Let me give you number five. True faith includes a growing and abiding relationship with Christ. Okay? True faith includes a growing and abiding relationship with Christ. Verse 23 says this, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now there's one little phrase in there that's really important, and that is, I never knew you. You see that? What does he call us to? It's a personal relationship. It's a knowing relationship with him. And this is what I love about our God. Um, Our God is not aloof. He does not stand far off from us. But what did he do? He drew near to us. He wants to be known by us. He wants to be in relationship with us. And he's gone to great lengths to reveal himself to us. So so we are serving a personal God. and, and, And when we stand before him... We can know him and he can know us if we've committed our life to him. So we're talking about that kind of a saving relationship. Let me give you the last one there. And I know I'm having to skip a lot because my time is gone. But let me give you number six there. Um, True faith includes a life of repentance. If you're one of those Christians that think, okay, when I came to Christ, I repented of my sins and placed my faith in him. And that was the end of it. You are very confused. Okay. Because... A Christian means that you live a life that includes repentance all the time. Unless you've arrived at sinless perfection, which I don't think any of us have, we are to continually live in a life of repenting and being made right with Him. That, that, that's a part of us growing in that abiding relationship with Him. We're to live this life of, of repentance before Him. Um, If you look there again at verse 23, there's those tragic words right at the very end. I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Um, And and so you hear that word right there. And literally the the words that are are translated there as you who practice lawlessness, in the Greek language, the word that's used there means workers of iniquity. Who is that? That be me. That's all of us. We are all sinners by nature and by choice, right? Who, who are those who practice lawlessness? That's a, that would be us. And the only thing that makes a difference is, is who? Jesus, right? Is that if we know him and we're in this continual relationship with him, we are living a life that includes repentance, turning away from sin, turning to him. I heard a preacher say one time, and I've quoted this to you before, and I, I don't know if it just kind of glides over our heads sometimes, but he says that, that as believers we should keep short sin accounts. And I like that statement. What, what do you think he means by that? That's right. That we are to constantly be in this relationship with him, that we're so close to... And listen, if you're in a relationship with Christ, every time you get near Christ, if there's sin in your life, you're going to know it. Because he is holy, right? So, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, Messiah, that means Messiah. That's good. Yeah, with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus can also be Jesus. It's a common name. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you all so much. We're going to finish this up next week. We'll be finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to finish it up with his closing illustration, which is I think one of, the most, one of the most beautiful parables that he tells of the wise and the foolish builders. And, and I, love, I love that. So he closes the Sermon on the Mount with that. Good to see the burls over there. Welcome, you guys. Y'all look great. So good. None the worse for the wear, right? <laughs> okay, but let me lead us in a word of prayer and we dismiss. Father, thank you for this time and your word tonight. Thank you for your salvation. God, we recognize tonight and reminded from these simple few verses that, God, we don't save ourselves. God, we don't save ourselves by all the good things that we do or don't do. God, we don't save ourselves by some profession of the lips, but we are saved by Jesus Christ and faith in Him alone. And we thank you for that. Thank you for your grace that you pour out on us. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for this time tonight in your word, and we pray, Lord, that um, even as we go from this place tonight, 
you would make us bold in our faith, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Lord, help us, Lord, not just to say, Lord, Lord, but to let you be Lord, truly Lord of our life. God, in our thoughts, our attitudes, in our, in our actions, how we treat other people, um, God, you take over. And Lord, show us our sin and our failings, God, that we may repent of those and turn to you and be filled with you. Uh, Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's you that we worship tonight. Uh, bless us as we go from this place. Be with our choir as they rehearse tonight. We love you and we worship you. It's in your name. Amen.